I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, Professor Sridhar Iyer. A little bit about Sridhar Iyer. There are many of us are IIT Bombay alumni, but he is one alumnus who has probably spent uh, amongst the maximum number of years on the campus. Not because of any failures, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> he did his B.Tech here. He actually went out to the U.S. to do his master's and Ph.D. But within one year, he realized that he can do much better work than the university he was in. So he came back and did his Ph.D. from IIT Bombay. He then joined IIT Gauhati as a faculty member. Uh, due to some family responsibilities, he was required to come back to Mumbai. It is at which time the fortunate coincidence when we had just started our school of IT and I invited him to join the School of IT, which he did promptly. And since then, of course, as many of you would know, our School of IT and Computer Science Department merged back uh, several years ago. Uh, he has been an ardent and passionate teacher, committed to teaching and teaching-related activities. Fundamentally, his area of expertise is computer networks. He did a lot of research there but discovered his passion and decided to work in area that is now recognized as educational technology. So he has been working consistently in educational technology. He has in fact helped us create a, a, a focused area of research within the ET group. He and uh, another colleague of ours, Professor Sahana Murthy, is not, not here today. Uh, in fact, Professor Sahana Murthy is the only full-time faculty member in the ET group. There are about 15 of us who are all associated with that activity. And amongst all of us, Professor Vikram Gadre, who heads the Center of Distance Engineering Education Program, and Professor Sridhar Iyer are probably amongst the maximally contributing people. Some of his research, I had mentioned Think Pair Share to you, uh, has been actually utilized by many of us here, and we all recognize the effectiveness, increased effectiveness in students' learning. So I'm very happy to present to you my colleague, Professor Sridhar Iyer, who will talk about not just think, pair, share, I hope, but yes. all, uh, about uh, the... Uh, today. Today? Mostly. Uh, today only. Mostly. Okay, fine. Okay. So, okay. thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you, Professor Fatak. So there are a couple of things that uh, that are interesting to note here. One is he carried away a sheet of introduction, which he kept here and he was attempting to read out. It was a blank sheet. <laughs> okay, so he he has basically said all this extempore, and one reason why he was able to do that is I am his student. So I I worked with him for my bachelor's project, and uh, now I have been uh, his colleague for. Uh, the past 17 years or so, 15, 17 years. Okay, and we run a lot of projects together, this being one of them. Okay, so with that much introduction, let's get started. So, let me ask this first question. Okay, so when we talk about MOOCs, one of the things that come to mind and one of the things that we have been um, propagating also is the fact that we should create uh, short videos, excellent videos, and these are expert videos which then students can see, and then we can use a flipped classroom model where students then come to class and discuss and so on and so forth, right? So the first question we want to ask is that, is it enough to create these excellent videos, okay? So I'll talk about one experiment. So what happened in this experiment is that there were two videos, video lectures that were created, okay? So all the correct things were done. The duration was correct, the topic was proper, all of that. And then it was the same content and the instructor. And in one case, the instructor spoke fluently, didn't refer to any notes, you know, made eye contact with the audience, all of that. And in the other case, the instructor spoke very haltingly, kept looking down, you know, kept hesitating and things like that, okay? So what do we expect? In which video will more learning happen? 
the first one, right? So we expect that the first video is going to be much more effective than the next, the disfluent one. Okay, so interestingly, it turns out that there is no difference in the amount of learning that happened to students in terms of what they were able to score in the exam. Okay, can you guess why? Because the method was different, no? The way they, the one, okay, the method of instruction was the same. The mode of instruction or the the quality of instruction was different. Yeah, what else? What else could be a reason? Hmm? Sorry? Students were not much interested in either of the videos, so it didn't matter really whether you did a great video or not. <laughs> okay, then. Huh? Lack of interaction is one, okay. Huh? They are only listening. Okay. Okay, let me ask a slightly different question. So just think of the subject in which you are really the expert. Okay. What made you an expert in that subject? What is it that you did to become an expert in that subject? Tutorials. Tutorials? Little more? Yeah. To create the interest. Self-learning. Self-learning. So essentially the point is it's not really how well the instructor is able to deliver. If you are to become an expert, what the key is the practice, right? How much practice? So why did the students who did well do well? They did well because they practiced. They did the problems, okay? They went home and worked. All of that. Okay, so that's the key point. So what we are saying is improving the fluency of lectures does not necessarily imply that better learning is going to happen. So we need to focus on identifying what does lead to better learning. Okay, so then let's ask the other question. When we go from MOOCs to blended MOOCs, okay. So now, say okay, I have excellent videos and like many of you said, interaction is the thing that is missing if I just look at a video, right. So plus interaction with a local instructor, is that good enough? What do you think? Students are interacting with the local instructor. It's not like the MOOC instructor in interacting with local instructors. Local instructor interacting with students locally. Is that good enough? Yes. Yes? Okay. It's better. Okay. That's a good answer. It's better. Okay. But it still does not cut it. Yeah. Somebody wanted to say something there. Yeah. Same point comes, student learn by self-learning, but the local instructor teaches in local language, but the contents are excellent. So student take both, local instructor instruction okay. and the contents from excellent video. Okay. So I think that is a good one. Okay, so this is a good one, but still, I'm going to say that in most cases, the answer is still no, okay? Because once again, this works for students who are self-motivated, students who are interested. All of those parameters have to be met, okay? Why? Because if you look at the average student who's kind of medium interested in the subject, who's there because, okay, you know, it's there in the curriculum, I'm being forced to sit here, let me listen to this guy, somehow I have to pass the course. A lot of people are in that category, okay? So for that category of students, basic problem is students don't pay utmost attention, right? Even right now, I'm thinking that everybody is paying attention to me. I doubt if more than 50% are really paying attention to me, right? So we expect like some people are fiddling with their mobiles, I can already see there, some of them are having their laptops doing something else. I wonder are they taking notes or are they checking their email? <laughs> so, so many things are there, right? So students don't pay utmost attention, however well we interact or we attempt to interact with them. Second thing is, students think that they know or understand because they are able to follow the lecture. This is a very big one, okay? Because for most good instructors, we are great lecturers. So when the student is sitting there and I am working out the example, the student is able to follow because the clarity is in my mind, not in the student's mind, okay? It's only later they realize that they have not really understood the topic. Okay? So something has to be done to make that happen, okay? Then as an interaction, when we say that, look, interactivity is the main thing that's going to make um, my students learn, it's difficult to ensure that all the students in the class participate actively, even if you see now. Okay, so there'll be a person here, a person there, a person there who answers, who responds to me. It's hard to ensure that the people who are shy somewhere here, somewhere there, they also participate. Okay, so that is a key difficulty. Okay, students with high motivation, high achievement levels, loud voice, they drive the pace, right? 
and students were a little diffident, they get left behind. Okay. And also students have a barrier responding to the instructor directly. You know? So you always feel that, look, maybe my question is too stupid, I should not ask this question. How many of us feel that? No, we feel that all the time. So these are the barriers that come in the way of even an interactive class. So what we are doing right now is a typical interactive class. And even in such a class, these barriers come in the way. You don't ensure that, okay, every student who is there is engaged with the content, no student is getting distracted. Yes, question. Sir, I think inst uh, interaction should be must because uh, if interaction is not uh, in any lecture, then queries remain always queries. What about queries? That's How correct. So, okay, let me clarify. I'm not saying interaction is not required. You told in, in first, in most cases, it's no. It's How not it is good enough. But I think so, 100% interaction should be must. Then, uh, what about queries? Queries remains always queries. That's fine. I'm not saying no to interaction. You have not got the point. Okay, the, what I'm saying is, you need something more than interaction. Okay, fine, sir. That's what I'm saying. Okay, interaction is definitely required. Okay, what we need is something more. So, what is that more? That's what we are trying to get to. Okay? So, queries have to be answered, but only students with high motivation even speak up. So, there may be, take this particular audience itself. You know, there may be a question in somebody's mind over there. That person may or may not have asked the query. So, there needs to be a mechanism where which everybody's queries can come. That is the point I'm trying to make. Okay? Okay. So, moving on. So one solution for this problem is what is called active learning, you know, making an active learning strategy in the classroom. Okay? So the active learning, the basic definition is that students are going to engage with the content by writing, reflecting, thinking. See what we realize that the only way I become an expert at something is by practicing that thing. I don't become an expert at something by listening to somebody. So I need to practice that thing. So and what we want to do in active learning is get students to do that practice right there. Okay, so that's the key point. So there are many informal strategies. See, many of us do this. I mean, it's not like something very uh, revolutionary. Many of us do this in our class. We make small groups and things like that. So the only thing that we say in order for something to qualify as an active learning strategy is that we have to carefully design these activities. They should be explicitly based on theories of learning. There should be some theoretical basis to saying, okay, why I'm creating the activity in this manner. Otherwise, as teachers, we always have a lot of guesses in our mind, right? We feel that, okay, this is not happening, let me try that. And we feel that that will work. So those don't qualify as formal active learning strategies, okay? So there has to be some theoretical basis and they have to be evaluated repeatedly through empirical research. That's what is called active learning, okay? Does it really help? That's the next question that we want to answer. No, why should I bother to learn some active learning technique before I know whether it really helps. Okay, so there was this huge experiment that was conducted. Okay, across 6,000 students, 62 courses, variety of colleges and so on. And what was measured was how much did the students learn at the end of the course. Okay, and this is what they found. Okay, so all the red is what people who were lecturing, mostly lecturing. And all these people who were lecturing were also great lecturers. They were not like poor lecturers. They were great lecturers. Many of them had won best teacher awards and things like that. Okay? And you find that students by and large learnt about 25% of the content that they were supposed to learn. Okay? So that's what the roughly the red bar is showing. On the other hand, if you take the, other, the green ones, which is the instructors who did some kind of active learning strategy in their classroom, you find that there is a range, but which starts, the lowest is almost as good as the best lecturer. Okay? So even if you do a poorly run active learning um, activity in your class, it still is going to be almost as good as a very great lecture. You know, that's a big deal. Okay? And if you do a good job, you can get learning gains up to 0.7, which is a really big deal, okay? So that's basically what this uh, slide is saying, okay? So what we want to see is, find out some of these strategies, okay? So one of these we will be talking about. So what are the features of active learning strategies? 
So the first one is that students engage in some problem solving activity, some engagement with the content during the class, okay? not later on just before the exam, but while the class is going on, you want them to engage with the content. Okay? Specific ideas are elicited, students are asked to express their reasoning and all of that. Okay? Let us do this through some examples. So there are several such strategies. And I use the first three on a fairly regular basis. Okay? So one is called T think pair share, one is called peer instruction, one is called team pair solo, many others are there. Now each of these have their own um, specific situation in which they are most appropriate. Okay? So peer instruction for example you may have already encountered in the notion of clickers. Okay? So when you set up a clear question, a clicker question that is one step of the peer instruction. The second step of peer instruction which is also needs to be done with the clicker question is a discuss between the pairs and then vote again. Okay, so what I will be talking about today is the think pair share, one activity. Okay. All right. So this time to do something now. So consider a large class, this is a problem that I am posing, okay? consider a large class, okay? maybe an auditorium like this in which a class is going on and imagine that I am going on for 90 minutes which is what my duration is, right? one and a half an hour. Okay? And what you have to do is predict the number of students, consider that you are students okay? and you have to predict how many people in this auditorium are going to be listening to this fellow for 90 minutes, okay? that is your job. Okay? So what you want to do is, you want to plot what is the percentage of engagement, what is the percentage that of the audience that is going to listen to me as time progresses. Okay? So you all have your notebooks, try to draw this graph, okay, draw a graph of engagement versus time, okay, that is the goal. So imagine a class like this in which maybe I am the instructor or maybe you are the instructor. Imagine students sitting there and try to predict how is the students engagement or students paying attention to the instructor going to vary as the class progresses. So do this on your own, we are not yet ready to talk to each other, I will give you time to talk to your neighbor. So first some graph of yours, your own has to be drawn, done, has everybody drawn a graph? Okay, how many people need one more minute? Okay, 30 more seconds. Draw your own graph. Okay, so that's the think phase. So you have done your own thinking about what, how the graph of students engagement versus time is going to look. Okay, now let's move to the next phase. So now we are going to do this in pairs. Okay, so whoever is sitting next to you, it doesn't matter right side, left side and all, there is no rule. Okay? And what you want to do is examine each other's graphs saying okay, I got a graph like this, what was my thinking that made me give a graph like this, somebody else may have drawn a graph like that, what was the thinking for your neighbor to come up with a graph like that. That is step one. And step two, come up with an idea by which the graph can look like this. What does this mean? This means that all students are engaged for 80% of the students are engaged for 80% of the time. Okay? Go ahead. Talk to your neighbor now. Look into your neighbor's graph. See if it is similar to yours. Most people seem to have done this part of examining each other's graphs and throwing stones at each other saying, nay, nay, aisa nahi hoga, aisa hoga and all of that. Okay, now move on to the next step where you come up with a technique. What is it that you can do in the class? to ensure that 90 minute class students are consistently engaged. Okay? So what can you do? Can you show a video? Can you do a drama? What is it can, that you can do to keep the attention? So we are moving on to this next step. Huh. So that is the correct phrasing. Abhi activity kya lena hai? Aisa ane ke liye graph. Sir, hmm. uh, it depends on the lecture, whether the first lecture or last lecture. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Ah, 
okay, okay. That's an answer. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming to that. Okay, possible solutions for engagement. Yeah, somebody said repeat the lecture, right? <laughs> At a interesting time. Suitable time, I'll say. Huh? Okay, I'm not going to use numbers and all. I'll just note down. Okay. Somebody else was saying? Role play. Okay. Can we do role play? So, okay. The thing is, now as people are giving suggestions, what the others need to think about is evaluate the idea. Okay. So, if I say role play, you have to think, okay, how many role plays will I be able to do in a 90 minute class? Will it sustain? So, that sustained engagement, see, that's the point that what we have here is not simply engagement. Okay. It's not saying ki, I want the class to go up once to 80% and then kuch bhi ho sakta hai. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that we have to stay at 80% or above. So can each of these techniques, we should ask this question, can it do that? So, okay, group activities, such as what? See, it's not enough to simply say group activities. You have to give me an example, such as what? Group activity can be like, okay, talk about what you're going to have for lunch. Think pair share chhod dete hain. Okay. Think pair share. Real time examples. Ha, good one. Real time examples. We can throw quiz after every 30 minutes. Real time examples. Throw quiz after every 30 minutes. Okay. Throw questions. Add them randomly. Yeah, go ahead. I'm listening. Huh? Okay. Give marks for right answers. Sir, explain technical terms with non-technical terms. Hello. Hello. Actually, sir, student understand. Uh, Forever non-technical terms, so just compare your technical terms with non-technical terms. Actually, that's a good one. Yeah. So, for those of you who laughed, so this, so many of you found this to be a strange suggestion. Okay, explain technical terms with non-technical terms. Actually, it's a very effective one because one of the things that prevents students from learning is the jargon. Okay, and in fact, in when I teach networking, the first thing that they do is a totally non-technical exercise. And then only you bring them into technical terms. So, uh, for those of you who found, because I, I am commenting upon this particular one, is because I heard people uh, think that it's not a valid one. Okay, now you can go ahead. What is it that you wanted to say? Tell me, sir. You can start with the known and then you can go for unknown. Start with known and go to unknown. Yes. Sir. Huh. So, sometimes uh, rewarding a student, uh, whosoever completes the activity first. Hmm? So sometimes we can give reward to a student who's okay, ever completes that's the activity Give marks for the right answer. Sir, Somebody here. else had a comment here, yeah. After, after your class, around 20 to 25 minutes, you tell a joke to the students. Tell a I joke. <laughs> Most okay. of the students who are sleeping, they will pay attention. Okay, tell a joke to students. Most of them will... We have to conduct them. games. Conduct games. We have to uh, uh, play animation videos. Okay, play which is uh, related to our subject and uh, unrelated one. So I'm sure we have to play Remember to reference the, the student. In the class. Remember. <laughs> Sir, one thing more. Somehow, somehow, huh. we have to bring all the minds of students to the classroom. All the? Minds of the students. Ah, so that is the question. How? The somehow is not enough. Yes, sir. Uh, some environment you have to create. In environment you have to create. Yeah, so what is it that you are going to create in the environment? No, so these are all problem specifications which are masquerading as solutions. So ask the students to come to the blackboard and explain whatever you have taught in the class. Ask students to come to blackboard, okay. Okay, very good. Sir, hmm. at the beginning of lecture, we discuss three to five, uh, in three to five minutes, the previous law topic. Make the ready. Previous lecture, previous okay. topic. So, any ideas which are not already listed, new ideas. So, we'll have to reward for asking good questions and uh, answering also. Answering already it is listed, asking questions also we should reward, sir. 
Okay, reward for asking questions. Okay. Maybe class interaction, who interacts more, that maybe semester end we should give some credit. Asking questions. Okay, five marks to you. Huh. Giving an analogy. And put some competitions in between those two groups. Make a group and put competitions. Okay. Somebody from that side, yeah. Yes, sir. As a teacher, I have a great command on the subject matter and lecture so that students automatically pay attention. They should gain something from the lecture. So there should be a direct contact between teacher and student. The topic will be clear to the teacher. He can clearly explain to the student. Then I think student will not deviate. So this is the key point. Okay. So this is again another important misconception that needs to be addressed. One minute. Okay. Get lecture so that students automatically pay attention. Ye nahi hota hai. Okay, this is the point I am trying to make. This was my first slide. This does not happen. However well you lecture. Okay, students only seem to pay attention. Students only think that they understood. Students learn only when they practice. Yeah. When, uh, when students are solving examples, uh. go to them and help them. Okay. Uh, give them some clues so that they can uh, go forward. Give examples and clues. Okay. Uh, uh, discuss with current affairs, news, and current issues. It will improve general knowledge of student. In a networking class? <laughs> yeah, we can change environment. Okay. We can give an analogy at the start of the lecture. Analogy is already listed. Okay, I'll uh, write it again. Relate your discussion with the career. Huh? Relate the topic with the career. Okay, that's a good one. Relate topic with a career. So this is a very uh, common one that I use. For example, when you are talking about a topic, if you tell them, look, when you are going for a job interview, I say questions aate hain. These type of questions will come and suddenly everybody will be paying attention to you. Okay, that's Hello? the kind of thing. Yeah, that uh, lady has been... Tell students, prepare courses and bring to class and let them exchange their courses and then solve. Good one. Tell students to set quizzes. Sir, what, uh, uh, another solution is uh, to make the quiz, uh, yes, this sir. here, huh. make the quiz as per uh, the application domain of the topic that has been taught in the class. Yeah, quiz. Or it may be a reverse word, you have to first uh, fire the quiz related to the realistic application okay. and ask what is related. Okay, last question, last response. Huh. Sir, one point is left. Uh, we should shift the seating plan of the students time to time. <laughs> it's a good one. Again, there's nothing to laugh. It's a good one. Change seating plan from time to time. Why this also works? Because people get, you know, once one is the blood circulation and second they get used to that group. You break that group. Okay, absolute last one. Hmm. Oh, okay. Hmm? Don't stick up to the class. Get it? Yeah. Interact with the students. Yeah. So there are a lot of points uh, which has been covered. So I I think that uh, there should be uh, day by day practice. Uh, uh, first point you can apply on the first day. Second point you can apply on the second day. <laughs> Try to do something new every day so that the student get excited and uh, will attend the class daily. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, apply uh, now. Daily new methods to okay. be applied. Hello, sir. Excuse me. Uh, last, last response, I think. So. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, it, this is also depends upon the student's standard. Suppose a first year student is there, then uh, suppose I am teaching a particular topic, uh, then uh, th uh, I will regularly ask the question from this topic. Uh, uh, solution. I ask for solution. Okay. Then, and uh, another thing is, suppose a student in final year and huh. I am teaching a particular topic. Huh. Then I will try to uh, uh, relate this that topic uh, to another stream, another concept. Okay. That's suppose, I am te suppose I am teaching computer programming. Hmm. Uh, if students are final year, okay. then I will t I will relate particular topic, particular concept through operating system, compiler designing, and automata. If student is final year, okay. if first year student, then I will try to make interesting. Program. Okay. Good. Thank you. So uh, what we have managed to do now in about 10 minutes or so, less than 10 minutes, I think 7 minutes is what we have taken for this. In about 7 minutes, we have come up with a whole list of strategies, okay. So some of these strategies will work. So the question that we have to ask is, which of these are likely to help me to sustain the engagement, okay. So one such activity is think pair share, which you also mentioned and which is the one that we use, okay.
So what is think pair share? What we just did, okay? So what did you do? First you thought for one minute, drew your own graph, then you talked to another person and came up with some strategy of what should be the graph, what we can do and then we had a discussion as an entire class, okay? So that's exactly what is think pair share. Okay, so why should we use this think pair share in blended MOOCs, okay, in this environment? So the thing is that the well-known challenges to teaching learning in large classes, they also apply in these blended MOOCs. Again, when you are in your center, you are going to have people whom you don't know, you are going to have an auditorium type of environment, you are going to have people who are doing something in that corner, somebody else doing in this corner and so on, okay? So the point is that many of the strategies that we came up with engage only some of the students. So what we want is a strategy that engages the entire class, not just those who are interested or not just those to whom I am talking to, but everybody. Take for example right now in this think pair share, even though there are people who have not responded to me, they have carried out the activity, they have worked on it, they have talked to their neighbor, they have listened to the discussion. That is the important thing that we need to ensure in a classroom. Okay? So uh, TPS is a relatively easy way to achieve this benefit small group learning during the synchronous sessions of a blended MOOC. So this is the formal definition, I am going to skip it. You have all understood it that in the think phase, the teacher is going to ask a specific question and students think about what they know and come up with some individual answer. The pair phase, the teacher asks another question which is related to the previous one. Okay. Students share their ideas and come up with the new answer. And in the share phase, everybody discusses, everybody throws in their ideas into the pool and then we have a discussion about those ideas, okay. So why does it work? It works because students are actively engaged and students learn from each other. See that is the whole point that suppose I were to give a lecture on what is a way in which to have students being interested in your classroom, okay. Just imagine that. I made one slide on each of these points, okay, okay. So just imagine that these are the points that I want to tell you and I made one slide on each of these points and telling you ki why this is a great idea, how you can use this idea to keep your classroom engaged. I start in, at 9 o'clock and I keep on going one slide after another till 10.30. It's the same set of ideas. Okay, what will happen? you are going to basically fall asleep, right? So now instead of that, it's the same ideas, but what has happened is the social process has come in. Students are learning from each other. So it's your ideas, it's no longer my idea, my telling you that, okay, look, this is the way to solve the problem. It's your idea which is being, so that's why there is a lot of buy-in for students to engage with that content, okay? And then there are a lot of other benefits. It makes the class interactive, Students realize that even others are struggling. This is again a very big benefit of this technique, okay? So often in a classroom you will find that students don't speak up, especially the ones who are not able to keep up, they won't speak up. But then the moment you let them talk to their neighbor, they realize ki acha usko bhi samaj mein nahi Theek hai, dear. then it is fine, we can go on, okay? So that is a very good uh, way for them to quickly understand or quickly clarify from their neighbor which they can't do with the instructor, okay? And most importantly, it includes all the students in the teaching learning process, okay? Okay, so now coming to this particular course on computer programming, TPS in a blended MOOC on computer programming. Okay, why should you care? Okay, so you should care because the MOOC will have TPS activities to be carried out during the synchronous interaction phase and you as a local instructor will be facilitating these activities and your student's learning is going to depend upon how well you execute the TPS, okay? So what does the TPS activity look like in computer programming, okay? All that graph business was all fine. How does it look in computer programming, okay? So we'll see an example and then we'll write one activity of your own. Okay, here's an example. So the question is that I want my students to write a program to find the smallest and largest element in a given array, okay? So there is an array of n items, integers, okay? 
I want students to write a program to find the smallest as well as the largest element in that array. How are you going to do that? Okay. So in the think phase, what I tell them is, so what I have is, each of these phases is on a different slide. For us to discuss, I put all of them on, a, on one slide. Okay. In the think phase, I tell them, okay, write the pseudocode, take out your notebooks, write the pseudocode for how to solve this problem. Okay. Then in the pair phase, I say, okay, now that you've got some idea of the pseudocode, work with your neighbor and come up with the C++ code for solving this problem. Okay. And in the share phase, I say, okay, here is my program for doing this. Let's compare, you know, have you used a for loop? Have I used a while loop? All those kind of things. Then we talk about in the share phase, okay, pros and cons. So this is the activity. Does that, is the activity clear to everybody? What I get them to do? Pose the question and then say what should be done in the think phase, what should be done in the pair phase, what is to be done in the share phase, okay. Do you believe that this is a good activity? Okay, so I mean if you don't believe that it's a good activity, the next part, next part is uh, irrelevant. But assume, let's assume that this is a good activity, okay. So what we want to find out is why is this a good TPS activity? Let's say I'm claiming that this is a good TPS activity. So what you have to do is figure out ki, okay, what is there in this that's making it work. Once again, I'll note down your responses. So what do you observe about this activity that you think makes it a good TPS activity? In that uh, students start thinking on their own. Students start thinking on their own. Okay. So if you, I'm doing this in a, you know, group discussion phase for lack of time, okay, you can talk to your neighbor, you can talk to your neighbor and then together tell me one idea or, I mean this itself can be executed as a think pair share activity, okay, I can make you write, I can make you talk to your neighbor and then we can share, but instead of that we are sharing directly, yeah. No, no, why? That is the benefit of TPS, why is this particular activity good? So that is the general benefit of TPS. Why is this particular activity a good one? A student will find that uh, for the same topic or for the same example, what other people's, uh, what is coming in other people's mind? Yeah, good one. What are the relevant ways of thinking uh, to that uh, particular topic? Yeah, so this is a good one. Students get to know how other people are thinking. Okay, I'll just go in a in a systematic manner. Okay, I'm, I'll start from there. Yeah. By writing the code themselves, they get to know what is the exact point where they are getting confused. By writing code, they will get to know where they are confused. Hmm. They know how to work in a team. How to work in a team, okay. But that's again general, we are now talking about specifically, why is this a good activity? Why are this, why is this what is being stated here in the think phase, why is this a good thing to say? Why is it? good to ask them to write C++ code with a partner, yeah. Because everybody need to contribute because they need to share it with your, their peers. Okay, uh, everybody needs to contribute. Okay, so I'm going to just take three from each row. Okay, sir. 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 Uh, can't take thinking, everybody's answers. <laughs> think, he is thinking self, then applying the knowledge huh. in a group and comparing that whatever the applied knowledge with the whatever the demo or uh, with others uh, other group members yeah so this again is a benefit of tps itself so why is this particular a good sir uh, this approach is having a glimpse of group discussion or uh, no, no, group again, study again we are going moment. broadly into the benefit of tps that's sir, not my so question. that is what the human tendency is that when we do something in this way um, we remember it very closely. So when the student gets stuck with the logic over there and he discusses with the neighbor, at the time of exam, suppose this type of problem occurs, he remembers that logic with the discussion. Agreed. So that all of these are agreed. Okay, okay, I'm going to actually impose a rule here. All of these are agreed. These are valid points, but they are all points which are related to TPS in general. I'm asking for very specific reason. The question is, why is this a good TPS question? Why is this particular question a good one? 
That is my question. Not why is TPA is a good activity. So what I what I feel that uh, this particular question is having the sequentiality uh, and the analytical behavior. So every question which has been uh, just discussed, it will be having some concluding remarks over the analytical behavior of the students. So sequential behavior is there and the analytical behavior is there. Yes. So this is the type of answer that I am looking for. Why this particular question is a good TPS question? Sir, yeah. Actually, this process relates with R and D, research and development. No, no, you are going back into why TPS is a great idea. We don't want to go there. Why is this particular activity, this particular question, this particular sentence that has been written, why? The user, self-motivated. Huh? Huh? Self-motivated. Okay. Huh. Students are uh, reading books only. Huh. This is the attempt given to the student that they have to write their own group, uh, pseudo code. Okay. Last night, uh, yesterday we have made a group discussion on the same thing. And okay. Sir. So, okay, so here again there is a good point that pseudo code. See, the point that I am trying to get across here. Uh, so, the knowledge and information of the students will be shared among the multiple students. Again, so that is the down. benefit of TPS. I agree. That is the benefit. Uh, uh, this column. Uh. Yes, sir. A, stu a student can get optimal solution of the problem hmm. uh, if they are uh, comparing it to each other programs. Okay. Oh. That's also so, uh, huh. so within a time limit we have to complete everything. So within a time limit you have to complete everything. That's huh. a good one. So there is order. The next one is order. The pseudo code next to the programming the order level. So a uh, weaker student get benefited. Yeah. Yes, that is true. Okay. So I'm going to move on. Last person's comment. Huh. All the class is involved in thinking process. Whole class is involved in thinking process. Agreed. Okay. So now let me say, let me illustrate why this is a good TPS activity. Okay, there are two, three points that I want you to observe here. Not the aspect of think pair share itself, but the first aspect that uh, which some of you mentioned, which is there in the slide, is that the first activity that you give is something which everybody can do. Okay, that is the thing that you want to observe. Okay, so the, you pose a problem. What has happened? First you pose a problem saying that do this, write a program to find the smallest and largest element in a given array. Okay? Now imagine a student who doesn't know programming, who is not able to keep up with the class. Okay? Imagine a student who has bunked the last two classes and who has suddenly come up into this class. Okay? Even that student should be able to attempt that problem in the think phase. Okay, that is the goal of the think phase. Okay, so if you write a very complicated question here in the think phase, if you say in the think phase, if I give a question like, okay, write an order and n log an algorithm for uh, sorting of an array, okay, that's a bad think phase question. Because there may be students who don't know how to do an order and log an algorithm, there may be students, many other things may be a problem. Okay, so what you want is, you want to say, that whatever happens in the think phase should be attemptable by everybody. Okay? So what is required to write pseudocode for this problem? What does the student need to have? Common sense. Okay? So the think phase question should be just based on common sense. Okay? What did I need you to do for drawing that first graph? Just your own experience. What did you think happened in your class? That's all you need. No specialized knowledge is required for the think phase question. Okay? Every student is able to attempt that. That is an important thing to note. Okay. Second point, so there are two, three points. So the first point is we set up a problem okay, which sounds interesting. Second is the think phase should have something that every student can attempt. Then the pair phase is connected to the think phase. You are saying write the C++ code with the partner. I, if I give a different problem in the pair phase, again it's a bad idea. Okay? So it has to be connected to the think phase. So I did this code. So the moment the student writes a pseudo code, okay, in the moment I say, okay, how to find the smallest and largest, okay, maybe I will go through the array one by one. And as I find it, I will store it. As the moment the student has written something down on paper, they are owning that idea. Okay? That's exactly what happened to you also. The moment you drew a graph, you feel, hi, hey, mera graph hai. this is my graph. And then you start talking to the neighbor and so the pair phase has to 
involve that logic which the student has themselves created. Okay? So these two have to be connected. So you say, okay, take your pseudocode and do something more with it. So now, okay, I may know the C++, I may not know the C++. If I don't know, my neighbor will tell me. Together, we'll figure something out. If both of us don't know, we'll ask the next group. Somebody or the other in the class will be able to tell me what is the syntax I need to use. Okay? So that's why the connection between, so the first thing is that it should be simple and clear what is required. The second thing is there should be a connection between the two phases. And then in the share phase, you're saying, okay, compare with this demo. So once again, now they have something of their own and they're saying, okay, here is the prof's answer. Let me see why my answer is different. Is my answer better than the teacher's answer? So those challenges they start looking at in the comparison phase. Okay, so these are the three main reasons why this particular activity is a good TPS activity. Okay, one, think phase is attemptable by everybody. Two, pair phase is connected to the think phase and builds on it. And three, in the share phase, there is something which everybody can contribute to the discussion. Okay, is that making sense?